PC, accounting for your future. Hi, welcome back. So, we just look at how we set up the audits JLJ before. So remember, we are still at the stage number two of the audit. It is where we're going to plan our audit carefully in case something will go wrong. Because our aim, remember, is to minimise the audit risks before we give the audit opinion. So, within the stage number two, when setting up, I mean, when planning your audit, there's two things that you need to do. I hope you can remember that. The first thing is when we're going to set up the audit strategy. And surely, that audit strategy tells you the scope of the audit, the timing of the audit, nature, as well as the direction of the audit. Of course, by setting up that audit strategy, it will certainly lead to the detailed audit plan. And this means the detailed audit plan tells the auditor step by step of how to uh, I mean, do the audits later on in later stages. So for example, before you dive into the financial statements, you have to plan. So for example, we're going to allocate the responsibility to different members within the audit team. So for example, Mary is responsible in checking the cash. John is responsible in checking the property plant and equipment. So that's what I mean by all this strategy before, which means allocate the uh, uh, resources. But the question is, if I ask Mary to check the cash, how could she check the cash? So, of course, that's what I mean by detailed audit plan, which means Mary would like to, first of all, check the bank statements to confirm the balances. Maybe Mary is required to reperform the bank reconciliation statement to make sure that the balance within the cash book and the bank statements actually agree with each other. So that's what I mean by audit plan, okay? So, when setting up the audit plan, it's not that difficult again. So let me just to uh, open up a new page and write it here. So, when setting up the audit plan, there would be three things or three steps that we're going to undertake in setting up this detailed audit plan. I mean, detailed audit plan means uh, how does the auditor will check the financial statements later on, giving us the guidance. So, because, uh, I mean, from the early study, you notice that from the auditor's perspective, so we are talking about the external auditor. So uh, from the external auditor's perspective, we are going to not to check all of his financial statements balances, yeah, because there will be millions of transactions. What we're going to do is we're going to sample check those balances within the financial statement in the first place. So that's what we uh, can do. So within the detail or the plan name, of course, we are not focusing on all of these balances within the transactions, but rather we are focusing on the material transaction, the risky transaction, and after that, we are going to design some of the planned procedure. I can call it as the audit procedures to check the balances within the financial statements later on. So that's it. We're not checking all of them. We are only caring about those important areas and also those important areas will imply that it's quite risky. So for those important and risky areas, we are going to develop some of the procedures later on to be used by the uh, auditor to check it. Of course, I say planned audit procedure. It is not the procedures that we're going to use within a planning stage. It is the procedures that we're going to use in the stage number four when we are doing the substantive testing later on. Okay, so that's it. So let's detail that. First of all, Let's look at the materiality. So, I said to you before, the materiality can be the preliminary materiality as well as the performance materiality level. So what we're going to do is not to set a benchmark here because the benchmark has been set in the audit strategy document. 
So for example, after calculating those ranges of the materiality, we're going to pick up one materiality figure. So any balances above that, we are going to check it. So that's what I mean by benchmark. So now, within the detail of the plan, on the other hand, you may notice that, well, because you're planning audit, you may obtain the financial statement. So for example, the statement of financial position, and you see the word inventory is worth at $300. And the total asset within that SFP is $3,000. So what you're going to do is to say, well, first of all, we are going to say whether or not the inventory item is material or not. How we're going to do that is we're going to calculate the materiality for that inventory and compare that to the benchmark. So according to the benchmark given by the ISA, there'll be more than 1% of the total asset will be material to the SFP. So 1% times the total asset here in this case, of course, is $3,000. So that would give us, I mean, anything that is above $30, right? So that will be material uh, to the asset. And in this case, certainly that the inventory is $300, which is much greater than the preliminary materiality level. And hence, of course, the in inventory is material. So another way to do this, so firstly, we can calculate the uh, absolute figure. If we were to undertake the relative measures to do that, which means, well, the benchmark is 1% of the total asset, right? So we are going to see how much the inventory has accounted for to the total asset. So it's, I mean, the inventory is 300 divided by a total asset of 3,000. So that would give us 10% of the total asset. And surely, that 10% is much greater than the 1%. This means that the inventory is material. So here's the thing. Because the inventory is material, I'm going to ask you a question. Well, is inventory misstated? So let me put that here. So because I said inventory is material, so is inventory mis misstated? What do you think? Yes or no? Well, the answer is they're not sure. So at the audit planning stage, we're not sure about anything. It's simply because we haven't checked it in much more detail, yeah? So that's the reason why, I mean, inventory is material because it says that the value is great because it accounted for more than 1% of the total asset. So it simply means that the inventory value is vital. It does not mean that the inventory is misstated. Okay? So remember that. So that's the first thing that we tick tick for those. So I said to you for the materiality, uh, the preliminary materiality can be material by nature, for example, the fraudulent transaction, for example, the uh, lack of disclosure but also it can be by amount for example the previous example is for the sfp one percent of the total asset will be material or two p l would be either raw relationship so it can either be more than 0.5 percent of the total sales revenue or more than five percent of the profit before tax so if that's the case of course one of them uh, uh, i mean this met that would be material to the p l so it knows the word materiality right now. So what we are going to do is we're going to check the balances within the financial statements. So we're going to calculate that materiality level uh, on our own. And normally nowadays, not only we've got the com uh, I mean the calculator, uh, but also we've got the computer. We can use the um, I mean the CAT, or we can call it as the computer assisted auditing techniques. We're going to introduce to you that in a minute. That's no worry about that, but uh, I mean, we can use the computer to help us audit the balances within the financial statements. Right, so that's the materiality. So let's have a look at the next one, which is the risky. 
So we are going to say whether or not that particular balance is risky. So here's the question. Are we talking about business risks or are we talking about the risks of material misstatements or audit risk? What do you think? A or B? Well, the answer for it surely is B, it's not A. We are not talking about the business risk. Because, I mean, the directors within a company are responsible for the overall success of a company. So that's the, that's the reason why the directors are responsible in identifying those business risks that the company is facing and deal with them properly. But from a shareholder's perspective, we don't care about those very much. But if those business risks will lead to the risks of material misstatements or audit risks in the account of the client's company, surely from the auditor's perspective, we care about those. So that's the relationship, that's the background I'd like to introduce to you. So for example, the business risk of a company is the company uh, has got a, a ma major competitor emerge in the marketplace and the company may not be a going concern entity, which means the company is going to go into bankruptcy very soon. And here's that, will be, that will be a business risk. So, of course, it will lead to the risk of material statement is simply because that the company may prepare the financial statements under a wrong basis. So instead of using the breakup basis to prepare the SFP, but rather the company may use the going concern basis to do that. And hence, of course, it's material, yeah? Uh, in this particular case, it's very material, as you say. So we're going to talk about that concept when we come to the audit report stage as well. So, risk of material statement. So, let me just remind you about the risks. So we talk about the audit risk equals to the risks of material misstatements times the detection risk. So what do I mean by audit risk is the risk that the auditor may give a wrong audit opinion. Why does this is the case? It's simply because, first of all, the financial statement may be materially misstated because of these two. For example, the inherence risk, secondly, the control risk. So, the inherence risk may take place in quite a lot of these situations. So, for example, if the balance of this transaction is very, very complicated in the first place, and surely there might be an inherent risk, which the risk happened in the first place, you cannot diversify it. It's simply because if the balance is too complicated, human beings uh, would make uh, such human errors relatively easily. I'm not saying it definitely that human beings would make error, but I mean, would make mistakes, but I would say that it's quite easy for those people to make mistakes. So for example, and also if the business change its operation during this year, okay? Uh, if you change your business operation, especially when you uh, purchase another company, you're entering into a new industry. So quite a lot of factors are unseen by the management team. And as a result of it, that would certainly be an inherent risk, which means a risk that uh, the management of the business will easily make mistakes okay, regarding this issue. And also, for example, the inherent risk as well, for example, if you are the cash-based company, 
uh, there might be an inherent risk that the cash may be stolen relatively easily by those uh, staff within your organization because we love cash, yeah? We love money. So that's the reason why uh, this is the case. And also, I mean, if the staff, or we are talking about the human errors, so especially if the staff is uh, junk or is tired, so when the staff is quite tired and uh, he prepared the financial statements, then surely it will be very relatively easy uh, for that particular guy to uh, make any mistakes as a result of it. Okay. That's the first one, which is the inherent risk. So let's now take a look at the control risk on the other hand. So control risk is the risk that the systems of the client's company cannot prevent or detect the error. So why this is the case is normally because that the system of the client's company are rubbish. So for example, there will be no segregation of duties among those people who authorize the transaction, record the transaction and maintain the security of that transaction. If those people are the same person, it will be very easy for that person to make any mistake or steal the money from the company. So, and also manipulates these records and the company cannot detect it. And hence, of course, the financial statements uh, is not correct. It's simply because in our books or in our financial statements, we show that inventory, we've got 50 items. When we go to the warehouse, we only detect 30 of them. So this means that the financial statements has been overstated yeah, for the inventory item. And hence, of course, that would be not good at all. So again, just a reminder that the risk of material statements is related to the financial statements in the first place. But what about for detection risk? Detection risk is the risk that the auditor cannot detect the fraud and error within the organization's financial statements. So why this is the case? Of course, we're going to break it down. Detection risk can be divided into the sampling risk as well as the non-sampling risk. Okay. So let's first of all talk about the sampling risk. So to my mind, the sampling risk, so let me just to uh, write it here. Detection risk could be divided into sampling or non sampling risk. So, what do I mean by sample? This means for the whole population, which means all of these data within the pool or within the financial statement, we are going to sample check a sample of them. For example, we only check three figures out of these 12 figures. That's what I mean by sample check the financial statement. We all know that concept already. So if we check that three figures, for example, those 12 figures are related to income tax expense calculation. We check only three figures in there, and after we've checked that, we say that there will be no problem with those figures because th these three figures are correct. But actually, it turns out that one of the figure is not correct at all, but you say that is correct. So why this is the, why this is the case? May, maybe because of your lack of experience as well as knowledge in checking those figures. So for example, when you're calculating your tax expense, you have to take the taxable profit times the corporation tax rate. When you're arriving that taxable profit, you have to do quite a lot of adjustments. Maybe from the auditor's perspective, you haven't updated your tax knowledge, and hence, of course, your calculation will be wrong, the same as client's complaint, and hence you cannot detect the fraud and error within the sample that you have selected before. And th that is what I mean by sampling risk. This means 
that we select the sample but the auditor cannot detect the fraud and error as a result of it. This means that we checked three figures out of 12 and three of them we say yes there were no problem but it turns out that one of them is wrong. So that's the reason why this is the sampling risk. So this means that of course this is the detection risk. Okay. What about for the non-sampling risk? So as I said we're going to check the tax expense of 12 figures. We only select these three figures on the left hand side. But what about for the nine figures on the right hand side then? For those nine figures, we haven't checked that as well. This means we only check these three figures on the left hand side. We confirm that there will be no problem. But it actually turns out that one of the items we haven't checked has problem. It's wrong. So that's what I mean by non-sampling risk. This means the fraud and error happens outside the sample that the auditor has selected. That will be a non-sampling risk. So, of course, sampling and non-sampling risk are both of the elements of the detection risk. So, one of the examples that is commonly tested by your examiner, the examiner will say to you, well, you are the first time auditing this particular complaint. So, because you're first time auditing this particular complaint, you're not quite familiar with the operation of within that business. So that will uh, certainly give rise to sampling risk, which means you check your sample, but you select your sample, but you can't detect the fault and errors within there. Or maybe because the way that you select your sample is not appropriate. Don't worry, we're going to look at how you're going to select the sample in the later section. But just to give you an idea, is this. So when I was an auditor in my audit firm, uh, I mean, our quality control issues is not particularly good. And for any of these undergraduate students coming into the audit firm, uh, I mean, our audit manager would tell them how to audit the items within the financial statements. Because in order to save time, uh, what the uh, audit manager is going to tell them is this. So you are going to select a sample. How are you going to do that? You will check which balance is vital or uh, which balance is uh, more of course you're going to select that sample okay so uh, i mean if that's the case of course uh, that uh, auditor will simply select those items which are vital but uh, ignores the materiality issues that kind of thing and hence of course which means you're sampling checking the uh, financial statement figures by your judgment and surely uh, this will increase the detection risk, i.e. the risk that the auditor will not detect the fraud and error because of a sampling or non-sampling risk. Okay. So there you have it. So you know the risk uh, relationship first of all. But now let's talk about some other concept of the relationship. Uh, I mean, whether or not we should increase uh, I mean, the detection risk or uh, decrease the detection risk. So here's the thing. Our aim for that is we're going to minimize that audit risk. So we will accept certain risk of material statements happening in the first place because we are sample checking the, the financial statements in the first place. We are not going to check all of them. Yeah, We're not going to check all of these balances within the financial statements. And hence, we accept a certain level of audit risk uh, on the first side. And hence, of course, if we think that the risk of material statement is quite strong, this means there will be lots of these complicated balances, etc. So what we can do is we're going to spend more time in auditing those, or maybe we're going to revise the materiality level. So 
I mean, we set the materiality level before, yeah? So any, final, uh, any balances above that materiality level needs to be checked. So we set that here, but now we think that the financial statements is quite risky. So what we can do is well, we're going to decrease the materiality level. By doing so, of course, we can check more balances, yeah? So, and hence, if the risk of material statements is relatively high, so that we're going to decrease the detection risk. So how can we decrease the detection risk? Of course, the ways that we're going to do that is we're going to spend more time and checking more balances within the financial statements in order to decrease that risk. That's the first thing we need to do. So, on the other hand, if the risk of material statements is relatively low, this means that the balances are not complicated, just the simple stuff, and the systems are perfect. So if that's the case, we don't have we don't have to spend quite lots of time in checking those balances in much more detail because we think those risks are relatively low. So that on the same side, we can increase the detection risk by reducing the amount of work that we're going to do. So in summary, there will always be the inverse relationship between the risk of material statements and the detection risk. So one is increased, so one is decreased. One is decreased and one is increased. Okay? Simple as that. Right. Let me just give you a little bit of example again for the risks. I just talked about the concept of risk of material statements. So normally, from the accountant's perspective, we are particularly focusing on the inherence risk, which means the balance uh, of the financial statements, maybe the accountant will not follow the IFRS when preparing those accounts, and hence, of course, the cause of a human error, so that because the balance is complicated, so that the financial statements may be misstated as a result. So, give you an example. So, for example, there might be a risk of material misstatements that the contingent liability would not be disclosed according to the IS number 37. It's simply because the, discontin uh, sorry, the contingent liability will simply be a disclosure, no, uh, be disclosure requirement if you are in a court case with the third party. And especially when your company is being purchased by another company, surely what the management is going to do is to hide that particular contingent liability. Because you, you will notice that from your previous level of your study, uh, I mean, when the company is being purchased, that particular contingent liability will need to be the actual liability. And hence, of course, the, uh, I mean, by doing so, of course, this, uh, the target company or the company is going to be sold uh, would not be very good. Because if you got much liability, Surely you will receive less money from the, uh, I mean, from the other party, yeah. So that's the reason why there would be an inherent risk that the company would like to hide that particular contingent liability by simply ignoring the disclosure note. So surely that would be the inherent risk. Of course, we will do quite a lot of examples later when we come to it. But before we move any further, just to notice here. The risk question that may come up in the exam would mostly uh, rely on the accounting knowledge that you've had before. So make sure that the international financial reporting knowledge is absolutely strong before you tackle those questions. Okay, so surely we're going to revise those issues when we come to the question H1. Right, okay, so we finish up the second bit. Now, let's focus upon the third bit, is we're going to decide the plant audit procedures. Remember, this procedure is what we should do in checking those materially risky balances later on, in the stage number four of our audit flow chart. So, let's see what are the components of the audit procedures, okay? So, just to give you an idea of the uh, planned audit procedure, is this. Uh, we are going to use the mnemonics for this, is where we're going to use the AEIOU credit. 
a EIOU credit, which is the action that you're going to do. But for any of these audit procedures later on, you also need to plus what to check. So for example, the E stands for inquiry, which means ask. So you have to say to the examiner who you're asking. For example, you're going to ask the management, so what to do. And why are you going to do that as well? Why are you going to ask the management? So why are you going to ask the management? It's simply because maybe you're going to confirm that the business is going to acquire another company. You're going to confirm that the business is a going concern entity, etc. So you're going to confirm something. So that means uh, when designing the uh, audit procedures, you are going to include three things. First of all, we need to include the action. Secondly, what? And thirdly, why? Of course, why, which means to confirm something. So, let's see in your study notes, and let's see uh, the examples I have given you by turning that page for the planned audit procedure. If you haven't found out that page, pause the tape and uh, find out that page on your own. So, the potential audit procedure to collect the audit evidence. So, what do I mean by audit evidence? Is simply this. We need to have the audit evidence in place, yeah? Otherwise, we cannot persuade the uh, court if the client sues us. And also, we're going to use the audit evidence to train our uh, new coming auditor, okay, as well. We're going to provide them with the audit working papers to teach them how to do the audit. So that's the reason why collecting the audit evidence is absolutely important. But the question is, how are we going to use the audit procedure or planned audit procedure to do that? Particular two ways to do. First of all, we can test the controls within the system, or within the client's complaint. So this means that we're going to test the client's system. So, for example, within that client system, if you want to purchase the popular plant equipment, for example, if you're going to purchase the factory, you're going to purchase the computer, before you purchase that uh, asset, you have to be authorised. This transaction has to be authorised before uh, it is uh, done. Yeah. So what you need to do is to get the signature, maybe from the CEO or the general manager, before you purchase that computer or before you purchase that uh, uh, factory. The simple reason behind it is this. So you're spending the cash in the company to purchase that computer or factory. So if it is not authorised at all, it is relatively easy for the, uh, for the staff within your organisation to steal the money, which means to use the money to purchase that asset. Uh, I mean, uh, that the business uh, cannot use it later on. So if that's the case, of course, that is, in, uh, that's in, uh, is against the best interests of the company. So that's the reason why we need to have this control system or control procedure in place. So what the auditor is going to do is we're going to test that procedure, which means we're going to see whether or not the signature would be in place before we purchase that factory or before we purchase that computer. Okay, That's what I mean by test of control. This means that from the auditor's perspective, we're going to test their controls to see whether or not, for example, in this case, whether or not the signature will be generated or be signed. The second way that we're going to, uh, I mean, use the planned audit procedure is we're going to use the substantive testing procedure, which means the substantive procedures. So we see the word already, substantive. This means we're going to check the figures in the financial statement in the first place. So in order to determine that substantive procedure, design that, audit pro uh, design that substantive procedure, all we can do is we're going to include three things. First of all, we're going to include the action, which is the A, E, I, O, U, and credit. We're going to what to do, and the assertion, which means why are we going to do that? 
what is your objective? So assertion, assertion, which means objective or what you what you want to achieve. So let's detail that. Firstly, we've got the action. I said to you there will be the A E I O U credit. So first of all, analytical procedure. So what do I mean by analytical procedure? It's simply this. We are going to use our head to analyze something, normally in the form of comparison, which means we are going to compare different information. So for example, we can compare the current information with the past information. So for example, in the past, you will generate the profit of $30. For this year, you've generated a profit of $30 million. So comparing the current situation with the past situation, in the past it's just to be 30 of profit, but now it's 30 million. If that's the case, to my mind, there might be a risk that the business will overstate its profit figure. Because this transaction is quite unusual. That's the reason why we are going to compare the information to identify any of these unusual transactions in the first place. Of course, we can also compare the financial with the non-financial information. So for example, uh, there has been the economic recession during this year that the profit that this company has made is still greater than last year. This means that, well, to my mind, if this economic recession happens, of course, we may think that, well, maybe the profits that the company can make will be lower than previous years. I'm not saying it is absolutely this, but it's very, very likely this will happen, yeah? So now, because the economic recession happens, but your profit stays very high, so maybe there might be a risk that this transaction is unusual. This means that maybe the company uh, has overstated its profit in the first place. So we need to watch out later on. We can also compare the budget information with the actual information. Of course, the budget information would be presented in the management account. So, remember the management accounting papers that you studied before, yeah? So the management accounting, uh, we include the budgeting, we include the costing as well as the uh, uh, performance measurement. So, for example, the budgeted information, for example, the budgeted uh, statement of profit loss. So, when we obtain that statement of profit loss, this is usually done uh, at the start of the year. Are we going to compare the actual profit with the budgeted profit? The actual profit will, will come at the end of the year, yeah? So we're going to compare the budget with the actual. So budgeted, uh, we budget to make $30 of profit. But actually we have made $30 million of profit. This means that I'm not saying that it's absolutely wrong, but rather I would say that this might be an unusual transaction. So we need to identify those and correct those or maybe watch out later on if there might be some of the mistakes happened within those transactions. Okay? So also, I mean, uh, in your later exams, when carrying out the analytical procedure, you're also comparing the current information with the future information. So why this is the case is because that we are going to compare that the current profit that you've made with the forecast information that you would like to achieve. So for example, you can make $30 of profit, but maybe at some point in the future you can make uh, a loss. You're going to forecast to make a loss. As a result of it, from an auditor's perspective during this planning stage, is we're going to question whether or not we should still be the auditor for this company. It's simply because if the company is not a going concern entity anymore, the risks to objectivity or the threats to objectivity will be so high. It's simply because that the client's company may threaten the complaint. I'm not going to pay for you if you're going to give me 
the uh, audit report saying that their financial statements are not true and fair, so that uh, I'm not going to give you money. So from the auditor's perspective, in, in, in order to keep that benefit, we're going to issue whatever opinion that the clients want. And hence, surely, this not be very good. So by identifying, by comparing the current with the future information, we can know that whether or not the company would be a going concern entity or not, so that we can decide whether or not we should uh, work for this company. Okay? Now, so that's the analytical procedure, which is the first A that we just look at. The second E, because I said to you, is the AEIOU, so the second E stands for inquiry. That means we are going to ask somebody. We can ask a lots of people, for example, ask the directors, we're going to ask the lawyer, we're going to ask maybe uh, the, uh, the staff within the organisation, so for example, uh, the audit committee staff, we're going to ask the operational staff uh, to see what's going on, to identify any of these operational problems, because the operational staff are quite familiar with the day-to-day -day running of the business. Yeah. So why are we going to ask them? because we like to confirm something. So it is not we're going to identify some of the unusual transaction before, because that's the analytical procedure. But for the inquiry, we are going to confirm something. So for example, we are going to ask the directors, what's going on? Uh, what's your business plan? Have you prepared the financial statements properly? Etc. And um, we're going to ask you, uh, how are you going to raise your finance for the uh, 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 project that you're going to do uh, in one year's time? So we're going to confirm something. We're going to ask the lawyer, on the other hand, especially we're going to ask the lawyer their advice or their opinion of whether or not the client's company will win the court case. Especially when the client's company is in uh, the court case with uh, another party, uh, with the customer, for example. So we're going to ask the lawyer, uh, do you think it's likely that our client's company will win the case? So if they say that, well, it's quite probable, it's more than 50% of chance that we'll win the case. Fine, so if that's the case, of course, of course, in our company's account, we need to disclose the contingent asset because we can win the case, yeah? So that's the way that we're going to, uh, uh, I mean, ask the lawyer because we like to confirm something. Thirdly, we are going to inspect something. So what do I mean by inspect? It means we're going to check the documents. There will be lots of documents in place. So that's what. What are the documents here? So for example, we've got the invoices. We're going to inspect the invoices it's simply because uh, for the initial measurements, particularly for the inventory as well as the PPE and some of the investment properties, we need to look at these invoices value. Uh, so for example, the price to purchase that property plant equipment is $30. So we're going to include that $30 into our capital expenditure according to the ISO number 16, property plant equipment latest one. We are going to inspect the contracts, particularly with the customer. Especially quite in, in, in the recent years, the customer, uh, I mean, demand is, uh, I mean, has been uh, improved, and hence, of course, they demand too much in most of the circumstances. And hence, of course, from a company's perspective, we certainly have to, I mean, uh, if the uh, customer has claimed for something, for example, your service is not very good, and please compensate for me for, let's say, $30. So we are going to inspect the contract whether or not the $30 of your compensation expense is being stated there. So, of course, if this is not the case, if the $30 is not stated, surely that the company uh, doesn't have to uh, provide for the approval liability of $30 as a result. We are going to inspect the management representations as well. So management representation simply means we're going to get the management to confirm something. So. The management representation is just to be a letter saying that this is the management representation. We're going to ask the management to confirm first, second, third, etc. questions. First question, have you prepared the financial statements properly? So the management will say yes and then sign the name. Second question, uh, have you, uh, I mean, 
identify any of these fraudulent transactions within the company and deal with them properly and implement a sound internal control system? The management will say, yes, okay, sign the name. So that's what I mean by management representation. This is particularly important. It's simply because in our engagement letter, one of the responsibilities is related to management. They are responsible to implement the sound internal control systems in the first place. That's the reason why it is their responsibility that this needs to be done perfectly. That's the reason why we're going to include that into the management representation to confirm that the management has fulfilled their responsibility in the first place. Now, of course, we can also inspect the insurance contracts as well to confirm that in some of the situations that the company will, uh, I mean, in some of the situations that uh, the company will face any of these uh, situations that the company uh, has not uh, expected before. So, for example, the flood happens, uh, I mean, uh, the fire took place and burned all of these factory files. So, can we get the reimbursement or can we get the uh, compensation from the insurance company? Of course, one of the ways that we can do that uh, before we uh, uh, recognise is the receivable balance from the insurance company is we're going to inspect the insurance contracts to confirm that the amount has been stated there so that we can uh, uh, recognise the receivable balances as a result. We can also inspect the newsletter as well to confirm something has, took, has taken place. So for example, very nice example is this. So imagine you're the uh, food restaurant and you provided the food to a customer and the customer is poisoned. So if that's the case, of course the newspaper has published this news onto the newspaper in the first place. And hence, of course, from your perspective, you're the client's company, you may be providing the provision liability, but in fact you haven't, simply because you're going to ignore this liability, because, I mean, you just ignore the liability. And from an auditor's perspective, when we are checking your financial statement, because we saw the news, and your restaurant has poisoned one customer, surely you have to compensate the losses, yeah? Maybe you have to be uh, punished by the uh, uh, local authority. From that perspective, you may have to provide for the provision liability in the first place. So by inspecting a newsletter, we can see, uh, I mean, what are the things that you need to do, but you haven't done, so that's very, very important. You can also inspect the claims from the customer, as what we've just talked about, because the customer demands so much. We can also inspect the disclosure note, uh, in case there will be any of this lack of disclosure risks might take in place in the first place. And also, we are going to, uh, inspect the computer records to make sure the record has been properly recorded in the first place, making sure they are complete. So we are going to confirm quite a lot of things. Of course, we're going to detail that when we come to the actual or the evidence testing stage. But now, just to give you a flavour, first of all, we're going to we are going to uh, confirm the completeness of the transaction. What does that mean? It means that when we go to a warehouse, we saw the inventory item number A. We have to make sure that inventory item number A has been included into the financial statement in the first place. So which means we are going to uh, standing from, I mean, in the warehouse and take that good with me. I'm going to chase them into the financial statement to see whether or not it's complete. The record in the financial statement to see whether or not it's complete. Whether or not it has uh, included this in inventory item number A. Alternatively, we can make sure that accuracy of that figures as well. So how can we do that? So it's simply this. We are going to inspect the non-current asset register of the property plant's equipment. And uh, we can see that value of the PPA is saying that it's to be $10. Of course, we are going to change that $10 to the financial statement of that PPE to see whether or not it's $10 there to verify or to confirm its accuracy. Of course, we can inspecting the invoices to confirm the cut-off issues. Cut-off, which means this is the year event. We use the year event to cut-off that period. That's why we have a cut-off. So why is that important? 
is simply because from the auditor's perspective, we have to make sure that all of his sales revenue is mostly expense. At the cutoff uh, point over here, so for example, this is the year number one. So this means that in the year number one's p &L, we only include the year number one sales revenue as well as the expense. We cannot include the year number two's uh, sales revenue as well as the expense. We can't do that. But in a lot of these situations nowadays, certainly uh, we include uh, the year two sales revenue as well as the expenses uh, back to year number one uh, to boost the sales revenue at the year end in order for the management to uh, have more bonuses as a result of it. So how can we do that, uh, uh, I mean, in real life is where we're going to, for example, if we were to dispatch the goods, surely we're going to dispatch the goods before the year end, but uh, that dispatch of the goods is uh, related to next year. So from that perspective, we are going to dispatch the goods. We should dispatch the goods according to the contract should be in March in the year number two, but now we're going to dispatch the goods outside the year event, and after the year event, or one day after the year event, the customer returns the goods back to us, and we're going to dispatch that, I mean, uh, in March again. So by doing so, surely, we will boost the sales revenue as at the year end. So cut-off issue, absolutely important. We'll have to scrutinise, or we'll have to inspect the contracts very, very carefully from the auditor's perspective. Surely we're going to expect something, we are going to confirm the classification of the balances. So for example, the receivable should be classified as the current asset, not the current liability, making sure that would not be classified wrongly. Now of course, we are going to make sure the occurrence of that transaction, which means that transaction has taken place. So for example, if we were to, un uh, we, if we were to take a look at the financial statements in the first place for the inventory record of $30, we are going to confirm that inventory of $30 actually taking place, which means we are going to chase it back in the real life, chase that inventory item of number A worth of $30 into the warehouse. We are going to confirm that $30 of inventory item number A has been, I mean, in the warehouse, uh, within a company, so uh, that's what I mean by occurrence. So we're going to take the figures from the financial statements back to real life, so that's what I mean by testing the occurrence. So we're going to detail that when we come to it, no worry about that, just to give you a flavour. And another O stands for observation, which means we are going to watch the process. So, especially for the inventory, Counting process according to the eyes number two. So, of course, um, normally, as at the year end, we need to count our inventory. It's simply because we need to provide the value for the closing inventory as at the year end. Of course, that inventory equals to the number of inventories times the value of each of these individual inventory. So, we need to confirm that quantity is correct. How can we do that? Of course, the staff within the company will count that inventory. Auditor will not count the inventory on their own, simply because we are responsible for checking them rather than counting it. So if we were to count it and we're going to check it, that would be a self-review threat to objectivity. So that's the reason why we are going to watch or observe the staff counting those inventories outside the year end. So we're going to make sure that the process has happened and uh, uh, carry out properly to confirm this occurrence because by doing so we can confirm that the quantity of those inventories will be correct in the financial statements as well. Now of course AEIOU U stands for recalculation which means we are going to calculate it, we, got, we are going to recalculate it by using our computer, by using our calculator. So we are going to recalculate the balance within the financial statement. So for example, there has been impairment of assets during this year. So what we're going to do is we're going to recalculate the balances uh, for that impairment losses. So by comparing the carrying value with the recoverable amount according to the ICE number 36. By simply doing this calculation, we can verify or confirm its accuracy. So that's why we're going to do that. Surely we are going to recalculate the tax expense normally in the real life because the tax expense is so complicated 
that's the reason why you're going to study the tax papers in the previous study or in the later P6 of your study later on. So uh, tax expense, we're going to recalculate it to confirm its accuracies as well. The final credit, firstly, C stands for external confirmation. So this is according to the ISA 505 external confirmation, which means we are going to obtain the audit evidence directly from the third party. So third party are somebody that is outside the company. Surely we're going to use uh, and we're going to receive that external confirmation usually in the written format, so written paper, for example. So what we can do, of course. Uh, in many of these organisations nowadays, we would like to store our inventory. Maybe we, we haven't got any of this uh, money to buy that inventory, uh, sorry, buy that warehouse in our local country because it's so expensive. So from this perspective then, for a lot of these organisations nowadays, they will use the third party warehouse to store that inventory uh, for their company. So whenever a customer places an order, so we're going to ask the third party warehouse to dispatch the goods directly to that customer. So we have to make sure that the inventory quantity as well as the quality stayed within the third party warehouse are good. So that's the reason why we're going to perform the external confirmation by trying to ask them and uh, in a written format, so in returning the written format, by the third party warehouse to confirm that the quantity and the quality of the inventory are good. So that, of course, that inventory surely belongs to our company, although it's stored in a third party warehouse, yeah? So we have to verify those quantities as well as the amount uh, will be correct in the financial statement. We are going to uh, obtain the external confirmation by obtaining the bank letter from the bank. So why are we going to do that? we're going to confirm the bank balances within the financial statement. So making sure that bank balance, uh, I mean the bank statement balance is equal to the cash book balance. So of course we are going to uh, perform the uh, receivable circularization by trying to ask those customers whether or not you owe us money. So if that's the case, of course we can confirm that the receivable balance is actually exists. Simply because a lot of organisations nowadays will simply overstate the res receivable balance by trying to create the fake customer. So by doing so, by creating a fake customer, you can overstate the current asset and hence you can improve your liquidity position as a result. But quite a lot of re res receivable balance may not exist. That's the reason why we are going to confirm that with the customer that you said. You said that Mary owes to you $30, so we're going to write a letter. That's what I mean by securize the receivable. Of course, we're going to look at that when we come to it. So we are going to ask Mary, have you owed us $30 to the company? So that we can confirm that the receivable balance actually exists or not. Finally, the final R stands for re-performance. That's the reason why it's the credit, C for confirmation, R for re-performance. So re-performance is where we're going to re-perform something that is within the company in the first place. So for example, we're going to re-perform the control system in the first place. That's what I mean by test of control. So we're going to re-perform that control procedure. So for example, that the accountants within that company has done the bank reconciliation in the first place. That's the reason why we are going to re-perform that bank reconciliation process to make sure that this process is has been properly done by the accountant in the first place. Okay, So that we're going to verify or to make sure, to confirm that the bank balance is correct. Alternatively, we can use the substantive testing, which means we are going to test the balances or test the figures within the financial statements. So how we can do that? is because one of the ways that the accountant or the company should do is to make sure when you sell something that we've got the dispatch notes uh, with the sales order form as well as the sales invoice and making sure that those details agree with each other. Otherwise, it simply means that this transaction may be faked. So that we're going to agree 
to make sure that the dispatch notice details will be the same as in the invoice. So that we're going to confirm that details are correct. And to confirm that the invoice, for example, we sold $30 of goods to a customer, so you can recognize that $30 as the sales revenue as a result. So in recap, what we have talked about here is the plant audit procedure. Quite a lot of things that we have to learn later on in the course. We're going to use action plus what and plus why, and that's all we need to do. Okay. Right. Um, right. I think that's the audit plan. And the final thing I'd like to talk to you about is about the question technique they have to use in answering any of these risk of material statements or audit risk questions. Three steps in there. Step number one is you're going to use the title. For example, you're talking about the contingent liability so that you're going to say contingent liability as a subtitle and underline it. And then you're going to write a paragraph So for the second step. So according to the accounting standard, the contingent liability should be disclosed. For example, according to the IAS number 37. And the contingent liability, in essence, the disclosure bit, so we're going to talk about the materiality level. Of course, it's material by nature if you're not going to disclose it. So there might be a risk that something is not done. In this case, there might be a risk that there will be a lack of disclosure of the contingent liability. As a result of it, firstly, there will be a lack of disclosure. But for other situations, for example, if you're going to talk about the impairment of asset, if you fail to impair the asset, if you fail to carry out the impairment tests, according to the item number 36, you may overstate the asset within the SFP and within the PL, you will under overstate, of course, in this case, you will understate the expense and overstates the profit. So what you have to do is to include these three steps. First of all, set out the title we're talking about. Secondly, according to the accounting standard, what you should do and uh, determine its materiality level. It can be material by nature or by amount. And thirdly, you are going to talk about the risk. The risk, something's not done, and certainly you will have the impact okay, onto the financial statements or lack of disclosure. This is a must. You have to do it. Okay. Very, very important stuff. Okay. So, the final thing I'd like to introduce briefly to you is related to interim as well as the final audit. So, normally, so let me draw a timeline over here. So, this is the year end and this is the year start. And normally, after the year end, we're going to perform the final audit, which means we are starting to uh, check the systems, etc. But before the year end, that's called the interim audit. So we sign a contract normally before the year end. So that we can plan something normally before the year end. Of course, we can plan something after the year end. That would be no problem. But normally, we're going to plan... Uh, do the audit planning before the year end, before we start our audit work. That's why we're in interim audit. And the interim audit, of course, we are going to audit the financial statements uh, of the clients company because the financial statements will be in place not until outside the year end. For example, the impairment of assets, depreciation, not until outside the year end. So that before the year end, we're not going to check quite a lot of things, but rather we're going to plan something. We're going to go through that systems. Okay, of the client's company to see whether or not we can rely on those. So that's it. So that's the audit planning that we just talked about.
A P C accounting for your future.